measuring a property, page 49, chapter 3, measuring and listing, which also includes grading a property, but that's okay. Um, people have their own, assessors have their own method of doing a house. I never do the outside first, I do the outside last. Um, simply because, in case you know, you never know what you might step in around the building or what's going on. And um, so I do the inside of the interior of the house first. I do not find it a need to go through every single room. Uh, if it's a modular building and it was built last year and you've got a floor plan on it, you don't need to go through all the, all the building. Um, I've been in some properties some years ago where they had some personal photographs in the bedroom that I don't need to be privy to and decided that I don't need to go through a building room by It is what it is. I'm not getting people's space. You can probably tell what a building is like from the front door pretty pretty quickly. You know, I don't need to go round and round and round. You know, if, kitchen and bathrooms in the bed. Yeah, and you usually can catch those right at the door. Um, you know, if it's been remodeled, you kind of know about that. There's a plumbing permit. I get all the internal plumbing permits from my CEOs and LPIs. Um, so we probably have a good idea that something has occurred. Um, if they have a plumbing permit, I'll go to the property, just knock on the door. If nothing else, I'll update a photo. If they just moved to the kitchen, they probably put in a new one. Um, does that add value? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Get an idea of what it does. How do you, and we're a smaller town, we don't do building permits for anything that doesn't change the footprint of the building. So mm. if they're remodeling their <coughs> kitchen and they're doing stuff like that, we don't know about it. We don't know about it. That's so exactly just, right. Okay. We don't know about it. Not that we don't know about it, but right. we just don't. Um, hence the research on Realtor.com and all that stuff. Just get updates. Um, some, you know, paint and paper. Who cares? The same with electrical and plumbing permits. Yeah. Oh yeah, we do those. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, we don't do electrical. We do plumbing. But most of my plumbing is replacing a hot water heater. Yeah. Most of them. And that's only a permit for that. If you have a contractor do it, you need a permit for that. <coughs> You should have it if you personally do it too, but we don't chase those very hard either. It's kind of more maintenance than it is, yeah. you know. You know, hot water heaters are like three, five hundred. Yeah. Um, we put in a hot water heat pump. It's a little more expensive than that, but works great. Uh, and we got the rebate <laughs> after they forgot it. Oh, we don't have that. Let me send you an email again. We're not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm sure. I wouldn't have bought that thing for that without the 750 rebate. Um, so I started on the, at the front door and, and would you like to look, look around? I thought, no, it's right here. Or if they put it on a big addition, maybe we'll take a peek at that, you know, a bright room or something. But it's not very often. Um, I won't say I look in windows, but when you're measuring a building, you can go, you know, okay. Uh, you know, but I'm not going. <laughs> so. Um, I've been up to some buildings where there was a, a fence and there was a deck built and I just took the camera. Yep, it's done. Okay, delete it. You know, that's a privacy area. I know they did it, but um, then I'd leave a note in the door that says I was here and I was checking on the new deck. And they go, oh, okay. And it shows up on the tax bill and they're happy as the dickens. So, um, start with the interior inspections to start in the basement if you get that far. If you, again, you know, I look at need. <coughs> Something, you know, what's in the basement? Electrical hmm? panel. Electrical panel. Framing. 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 If we're going to do all those kinds of things. Oftentimes heat source and yeah. water source. I'll ask them. No. Uh, new buildings, baseboard, hall. basements that aren't permitted mm -hmm. is what's frequently in the basement. Yep, basements. that's what's frequently in <laughs> But not in the stone basement, but okay. in the concrete basement. You can kind of tell. Sometimes there's a, you know, um, a daylight basement. There'll be curtains and you know exterior doors is regular house quality. Mm -hmm. um, you know there might be a basement garage that's been converted to something else, or they boarded it up because they don't want to drive underneath the building anymore. And, uh, all kinds of little things. The truth is, in the scheme of things, a finished basement is probably not a big value add in the big scheme of things. 
I'm not too concerned with most of them. I've had a few that were easily of same house quality with a big daylight basement, but the same, same quality as the rest of the building. Um, that I'm more concerned with. But, you know, someone's got a 1975 ranch and they put a little room in the basement so that you know, the, the kids will not make too much of a mess upstairs. And, you know, it is what it is. It's a couple of grand extra on value on a $140,000 house. Okay, goes from not too panicked about it. I'd be more concerned about them not having a homestead than I would be whether it's a finished basement or not. Um, when we get to, <coughs> and we're going to get the grading shortly. Um, the grading assumes that you've gone through a house, you know, literally foot by foot. Sometimes that's not necessary. If you've been doing it for a while in a building. You walk up to the building, you know what it is. You know, it's two by four construction, it's 1970s, 90s, or early 80s construction. You know, we're looking for a chimney. If there's no chimney, it's probably an electric heat. Does it have a heat pump? Heat pump. Those are outside. The window's been redone. Okay, yes or no. The door's been redone. Yes or no. Um, there's a house in Warren, and I was just updating the whole road, old Augusta Road. I was up there, just door to door new photos and everything else. Before I got to the building, I went, I need to drop this value. The place was rotting, right, start to finish. And it's funny, I left a note in the door and said, I'd like to, you know, can you give me a call? And he called me up and he said, yeah, I had it, I had it appraised about a year ago. I've been wanting to come down to see you. Because I was, I was off by, you know, some 50% on the bill. I dropped it 50%, the place is awful. <coughs> but that's his castle. I respect that. I'm not going to tell him he needs to clean up all the dog poo in the yard. It is what it is. But the house, you know, the sill was was broken off where the dogs had jumped on it and it was snapped off the window sill. And I'm like, you know, the condition of this building is probably fair at best. We lowered the value, so it's okay. Never got in the house, but probably didn't want to. Hmm? Probably didn't want well, it's like I said, little things. You know, I knocked on the door, and there's the broken sill on the window. But I'm looking at the curtains. I'm going, oh, that's not good either. <laughs> you can tell they've been there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you knock, you can hear the dogs scratching yeah. the inside. <laughs> yeah, and beating the house up in the front of the. You know, you look at the door, and it's marked. Um, it is what it is. The building's been damaged. I'm going to be fair. I don't have to go through every single closet in the building to know what the building's like. I try to find that balance between doing the job I need to do and imposing on people's privacy. There's a little bit, there's a balance there. Um, Is there a point where you report something that goes in the I report what I need to report. If there's an addition without a permit, I tell the cut officer. In one of my towns, I reported um, the code officer had just pounded on somebody for on a, on a boathouse shed. They had replaced the front swinging doors with other front swinging doors and had put a little step out the front. And the code officer beat them up because it's in the shrine zone. I went to another property, as it turns out, you know, six months later, and the building permit said repairing the garage but now half the garage is an apartment with a vent stack sticking out the addition with no permits. And also, it's a second dwelling unit on a substandard lot, and I reported that to the court officer. And he went to the first selectman, the first selectman called me in and said, we don't worry too much about code enforcement issues. And I said, then you're doing selective enforcement. And I mm -hmm. laid out this scenario. I said, you need to choose what you're going to be. Mm -hmm. If you're going to hook up somebody for replacing front doors on a shed, then you need to talk to somebody about putting plumbing in a garage and converting it. Right. So I put on the building on <coughs> the property card the date I was there. No, no permit for um, new 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 GLA gross living area and plumbing. No permits. So at some point it's going to get picked up. But so sometimes we run into those kinds of struggles. Yeah. yeah. But you know, if somebody's taken a deck and converted it to a enclosed porch, they put a roof over it, 
they're probably not too concerned with it. I'm going to change it to the porch and set up DAC. It's like too big a deal again in the scheme of things. I just asked my code officer, what things do you want me to tell you about? Mm -hmm. You know, and like, yep. you know, like a couple of those examples that you want brought to you. Yep. They've got so much on their plate. It's like, yeah. So even though it may be in the ordinance, it may not rank high enough compared to everything else you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm like that too. In the spring, it's all about building permits. I'm not really concerned about updating photos on a road that I don't need to go to until November. Um, <coughs> you know, you, you got to pick your battles when it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, grading, abbreviations, sketching the property. I did a property sketch here. Um, at some point, before the week is out, you'll be asked to uh, figure out the square foot. It might be in the book, I don't know. Have we all figured out? Page 53, is that what you figured out? And so that exercise is kind of a waste of time. Um, but you should, you mm. will need to know sketching out a building based on those descriptions. Uh, you know, problem 3A is not a bad one to go try out tonight. Uh, take you two minutes, but. Uh, should have an idea of how to sketch a property out, how to uh, calculate the square foot, the base square foot. Um, we're going to come to that a little bit at this point. There's a key right above it. You know, a, a six by six entry step may not show up on my, won't show up on my property card. But, um, ten by ten probably will. Eight by eight, you know, we'll see. Um, you know, everybody's got to get a step, has a step to get into their house. And you can stick a one long chair on it, it doesn't make it a deck. But. So a little common sense. Um, also, you know, same thing, I'm not trying to nickel and dime property make it look like we're just dinging them for every little thing. Um, it's a point of view and an attitude, but you know that number, that little step getting into the house, that's built in there somewhere. Um, same thing with metal roofs. I can't say the market is returning any value of metal roofs that might down the road. Um, went up to Sunday River Kingfield, a lot of metal roofs up that way. So that might be the norm in that market. Down this way, you know, everybody's using architectural shingles, and it used to be, oh my god, now it's like, yeah, there's just less waste and just as easy to put up. So that's why architecturals are being used more now. They just they look good, but, um, but there's just less less in the trash can, which is, uh, which is a good thing. Um, grading a building, this will be our exercise for the next hour or so. Evaluating a building, assessors use 10 basic components to determine the grade. Foundation, basement, framing, roof, interior, exterior, Floors, heating, plumbing, and electrical. And then there are five grades applicable to buildings. This is true under the state system. You can have more. If your town requires, you know, a six, seven, eight, nine, or you want to take three average and make four average, you can do that too. But we've got some low end buildings uh, for. Uh, double wides, I have them go to, coded as buildings, but I built in another adjusting factor in the cost code so that I'm valuing them is if they're buildings, uh, rather stick built. Um, at this point in time, you know, the higher quality double wides are just as good as some of the lower end modulars, uh, if not better in some cases. But, uh, so you make that judgment on your own how you want to represent those. Depending on your system, you can take their, their computer system or whatever you've got and twist it and bend it and add numbers and subtractions and factors and do all kinds of things with it that can help you do that. Um, for the purposes of the exam, this is what we'll be using. One to five. Um, So I'm going to ask you to go to page 57 and point out our grading.
grading schedule on page 64. Let's start here. Usually in the course of this, this uh, grading schedule problem, there's a lot of discussion on whether it should be 0.6 or 0.5. And the truth of the matter is, in the end, it probably won't make a huge difference. But we'll go with consensus. So grading a building, um, we'll start with page 64 in one hand, page 57 in the other. Under problem 3.3, it asks for foundation. In our foundation, it says excavation six foot six inches. And you would look to your grading schedule on page 64. Is that wrong? I've seen what they've done here. So we find six foot six inch grade excavation grade. What is our grade for a six foot, six inch excavation? Three. <clears throat> would this grading schedule be something that we would have access to in the exam, or are we kind of supposed to have a pretty good understanding of it? You'll, you'll have what you need to have. Yes. Yeah, you can't use nobody to remember this. <laughs> Truth is, I don't use this, but that's okay. Um, eight by 18. 8 by 18 footing, what would be your suggestion for that? Three. Grade 3. Um, 8 inch poured concrete walls. So grade 3 is a wall concrete block. Grade 4 is a Poured concrete, eight to ten inches. Mm -hmm. He also says poured concrete, then I concrete block. Eight foot, yeah, poured concrete, eight, oh yeah, eight, eight inches, seven feet. Is that what that says? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. Even seven feet, right? I don't know what that means. Does it um, mean that the eight, <coughs> eight inches wide, seven feet tall, like lower than standard height? I don't know. We don't know. That's a good question because I don't know. Um, I'm going to suggest a three might be in a better option. Four is eight to ten. I'd even go three point five if you like that kind of between. I'm leaning on a three. What do you think? Looks like three. Eight feet four is usually your average. Yeah. Well, it's, it just kind of looks like that whole row. It's, it's average in our market, but is it average on this piece of paper? Right. <laughs> Which is, we will always have trouble. <laughs> um, outside drainage. Is a grade what? Grade. Grade. And then waterproofed? Grade. Or five. Or four or five. Being the rest of the components are a three, I might lean towards a three. Or a little bit, you know, this is why there's always a little bit of, the more people you have, the bigger the arguments. When you have two that were either a three or a Yeah. So we can make a little note of that as we get down through all these ten components. We start leaning towards a lot of other things that are related. So there are five pieces to our component. 15 divided by 3 equals 3. And as I mentioned, by the time we get to the end of this exercise, it'll be pretty up. Um, basement. We'll go from the other cost schedule. Basement. Six foot, six inch depth. Six inch gravel base and a three inch concrete floor. Three. Three. Mm 
no finished rooms. Two by eight by sixteen on center floor joints. Two by eight by sixteen on center floor joints. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the other one's two by ten. Straightforward. Two by six by sixteen on center studs. Two by six. Two by six by sixteen on center. I'll do four. Two by six by sixteen on center rafters. Two by eight by sixteen on center ceiling joists. Three, four. Oh, three or four. Three or five. Four, five. Three, four, four. Three, four. That's the middle. Mm -hmm. Four. Three, four. 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 What do you like? I like three. Could be a three. Three is, you know, the rest of our components are leaning up a little bit. Maybe we shouldn't go two. The rest of the building is three. Or I'm not harp on any of that. I can't do this math. Was it? Comes out to three point three point six seven. Why did you divide by three? We've got an extra number. Oh yes, right. Good. It should be twenty over five. Five by five and up the five. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I think there's an extra. Let's see how many we've got. One, two, three, four, five pieces. Yeah. Yep. I was looking at your number at the end of the game. <laughs> I don't believe anything I'll write down. 17, so it's uh, <coughs> three and uh, two fifths over. Am I just right one? Just tell me. I'm all good. Uh, roofing. Uh, five eight CDX plywood. Five pound asphalt gray asphalt cover. Gray uh, drip edge and boxed corners. We've got these other two components at threes. Probably they were consistent. I have no hard one for you. Interior. <coughs> Half inch drywall. Three. Three. Hardwood kitchen cabinets. Your, your life history and, 
uh, softwood trim. Three. 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 Interior door panels. Interior panel doors. Small closets. Three. Mm -hmm. yeah, just what it says. Could that be a functional adjustment, maybe? Mm -hmm. If you were able to find that in the market? Siding. Three. Three. Builders great uh, double hung windows. Three. Six inches of insulation. So far, four, three, three, probably a four. <coughs> uh, two solid core exterior doors and two storm doors. Two exterior doors, custom hardwood, solid core. Raised panel, raised panel is not Carpeting linoleum? Three. Definitely three. How good they were consistent? <coughs> Number eight. So, on the test, would it be set up with all of this stuff that you have to fill in? Is Some of it. Yeah. Is it okay if we go uh, like three and a half, or do we have to choose like four and three? For our purposes, and for the exam, it'll be specific. Mm -hmm. We're, we're uh, the process again, so I'll make sure that I'm thinking it through. Now, this kind of tells me, what was it here, three and a little heavier for the framing part of it? Could be the same inside. Okay, three and a half is, you know, again, when we get to the end, it'll make a huge difference. Yeah. Heating.
Horsetail. Coming. So a little bit above average. Not much. If we dropped off, you know, if this was a point lower, not going to make a huge difference. 3.13 or less. So why did you divide by 10 again? Because we had 10 things that were adding up. Okay. Correct. Hold that thought. Keep a pencil or something in that spot. We're going to use this down the road. Maybe one sixty-two. And why should we waste a good grading exercise and not use it down the road, right? That's fine. Right. Cost approach. What a great place to use a grading partner. The most popular and effective method of value, uh, property valuation, is the cost approach, which is true. But you're going to have to adjust that by your local market. Um, there are cost services out there, Marshall Swift and a few others. Um, I tend not to use those. Um, I do a little quickie thing and I take all the garage building permits and I stack them into Excel, square foot, the uh, owner's estimate to build it. You'll know which ones are garbage. Get rid of those. And somebody else has built a garage, and you can get an average price per square foot for the average garage by using your building permits. Mm -hmm. um, why not use local data that's very specific? Mm -hmm. uh, the cost services are really good, but they're only really looking at the Portland market and the Bangor market, and even those are factored off the Boston market. So I'm a little better with my local market. Um, again, as I gave that example yesterday with the two maple leaf homes with the garage and the deck and the porch. I've got <coughs> some local paired sale analysis. I can jam that together with the building permits of people and what they're building and probably come up with something I can stick in my outbuilding cost formula and go, that'll be good for the next five years. Or I can go to Marshall. Marshall's really good about doing things that are unusual. You know, my, my, uh, my union farm and human tractor are big buildings, 10,000, 11,000 square feet. Uh, for, for a union, that's a large, large building. Um, interestingly enough, the two values are within $100 of each other because they are so similar in construction. Um, that's good. When uh, Union Farm put on an addition, and it was going to be, I forget how many square feet it was, it was a big addition. Um, they wrote down, estimated cost of project, $900,000. Thank you very much. Wonderful number. So when his original number was 700 for what was there, and I added 900 to it, now we're up to enough value where I think we're going to make them come in and bust my chops a little bit. And that was my answer. Now you put on a $900,000 addition, why do you think that shouldn't be added to the property value? <coughs> And like I said, coincidentally, the two buildings are very similar in size. They were within pennies of each other on the tax bill. Because you do multiple times, do you carry if you do that cost analysis and one your time is pretty close to your Yeah, time relatively period. close. Yeah. Um, Rennie's put on a large addition. That was 
it was a million seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. A million five, maybe. It's a big building we added on. Uh, which good. That means business is good for them. You know, if they're going to add on that kind of building. Um, they have a, a system, a, a rack system in the building that's a million dollars just to go and pick items for each store that goes in the truck that arrives the next morning. It's pretty cool. Um, you wouldn't think that Newcastle has this kind of infrastructure, though. Um, standard units of measure usually applied to large amount of properties. That's uh, cost usually sets the upper limit of value. In a realistic market, someone's not going to build a property for, they're not going to buy a property for what they can build a property. So if they're going to spend $200,000 on a house, and you can buy a comparable building for 160, you're probably going to build and buy a property. If you can build for 200,000 and it's going to be worth 240 when you're done, then it's worthwhile to build. Um, in the late 80s, when the market was just going foolish, people were spending more on buildings, constructions than they were worth. And I went, that's not good. And I looked at the median sale prices in Knox County, excluding the upper end stuff. So I'm looking at the median selling price, and I'm looking at the median income, and the selling or the prices, the selling prices are going, and the income's going. And I went, it's got to be some sort of a correction. <coughs> at a certain point, the, the lending institution's roughly a quickie number, 35% of income, is. Housing. So you take income times three, and that should be your median selling price, roughly. Cookie down and dirty. It got beyond that. And I went, we're in trouble. This has got to be a correction. We corrected for a different reason, somewhat. But I could tell the market in 06, 07 was overcooked. I'm a little concerned about that right now. Um, interest rates have something to do with that, but the interest rates have been relatively stable. They talk about, oh, they're going up, they're going up. It's like, no, no, no. The bank is the only one saying, oh, they're going up, they're going up. They, they've gone up very slowly. Um, but that's one of those little quick measures where I could see that gap getting wider, and I really felt that the, you know, there was something coming 07, 08, or 09 or something. I knew it was coming. I just didn't know what, and I didn't know how. I'm not that smart. But, but I knew that incomes weren't keeping up with, median incomes weren't keeping up with medium selling prices. It has to be a correction somewhere along the line. And it did. Um, <coughs> conventional, I talked to most of the appraisers in the area, and they think, and I agree, that values right now are back to that 06 level, maybe. But incomes are stronger now as well. So a couple of years ago, they were pretty much 02, 03 values were <coughs> the same as 15 values and 16 values. And they come all the way back to that point, for the most part. Um, alternatives to his cost schedule, contractors or quantity survey. I don't think they worry too much about that anymore. Uh, farm properties. A farm property may appear to be a residence, however, it may be a commercial property. It may be kind of home occupation. It could be um, a gentleman or gentlewoman farming operation where they sell flowers in the <coughs> spring and vegetables in the fall and somebody's quasi retired and that's all good too. Um, most things that are home occupations, um, I consider those to be incidental to the residential use unless it kind of flips. Um, Oxbow Brewery has a, had a, a building, they started brewing in Newcastle back on the back road. And it was basically where the owners lived and they started pumping yeast and water and stuff and however they do it and now getting beer and next thing you know they've they've overgrown their facility. And that's really what happened there. So that, that property has switched more from being residential now to a commercial kind of venture. It's still back on the road of Old Jonesburg Road, but um, they've had to do some things planning board wise to expand their parking expand their facility a little bit. Um, but there's a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment there. They do they're quite a business, they're very successful. That's great. Um, but they're no longer a, a residence. 
Uh, manufactured housing has its own unique challenges, commercial the same. Uh, when we start seeing commercial properties being uh, foreclosed on, I'd be concerned. Something else is happening. Um, most of the commercial properties are on a seven year balloon payment. So in the last round, the commercial property values had dropped. You know, so it was appraised for a million dollars and loaned on a million dollars, and now they, have, now they still own 700,000. But because of that seven year balloon, they've got to get reappraised, and now it's worth 500. And some banks were saying, we need the difference. How do you do that? This is, you know, this, it is what it is. We've got cash flow and we can make the payments, but because the market had dropped so much, there was a gap between what the mortgages were now worth and what the new appraisals were. And that became problematic for a bunch of people. And so you would see foreclosures occur on properties that were on businesses that were doing well. They just couldn't finance that difference from the loan amount that they had in the new price of uh, Most banks, I think, worked with, if they had a good cash flow and everything, <clears throat> most banks said, we're good to go. The financial auditor said, yeah, I'm gonna cause more issues than we solve just because of lending guidelines. So they had to be very careful. That was not a common question. Um, of course, the first thing they did, was, my value went down, you need to lower my value. I think like, well, I only had you at 400 in the first place, so now you're at 500. <laughs> When you're at a million, you didn't come in and say, raise my value. So, so it's very, that, that market can be very, very scary. Um, <clears throat> cost approach, established and replacement cost of the building, we'll come right to that. Uh, depreciation, established depreciation and subtract from replacement cost. We had this conversation yesterday. What is the order of battle? Is physical depreciation first? Functional second as a subtraction, as a percentage, and then economic last. Page 77 in yellow, just saying. External seven. External. What did I say? Economic. Gosh, I'm telling you. Oh, it pegs. You just stop. Mm -hmm. The camera's running, I have to be careful. <laughs> Taking all the fun out of my stories here. <laughs> <laughs> um, physical, functional, external in that order. Um, replacement cost, replacement, what's the difference between replacement and reproduction? It costs so it to <laughs> would that be like if you had an old house with the, the wood <clears throat> trim and all of that stuff? If you you can replace it with something different or reproduce what was there to which costs more. Right. Right. Okay. Now how how big are the hardwood flooring boards nowadays? Right, like this. That one. Yeah. Two, three feet. Right, but they're also usually skinny. Yeah. So the new ones are oh my gosh. Um, in our house we've got uh, maple and oak and they're thirteen feet yeah. long. They go wall to wall. All the way across. You don't find 13 foot maple boards anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, re reproduction costs would be putting back the same 13 foot boards. Um, replacement costs are going to go, okay, we're going to piece these in, so it's kind of like so much. But, um, you know, one of our floors is a, has a maple in the center and, and oak on the outside, but the oak is, is they're all and a half, 13 feet, and then they taper down. They're all solid one piece boards all the way around it. Um, very cool, but. The same, like I worked in old houses with that they wanted to replace trim. That's all this, you know, fancy yep. um, molded, you know, yep. carved stuff. Yep. And it costs a lot more to replace that than yep. just to go get exactly. a piece of colonial trim. Yep. We've not taken them out. <coughs> you know, just, we've sealed the lead paint. Mm -hmm. We've not taken them out because you can't replace them. Right. Now for what it's worth, I've right. done. To have a mill. Yeah, Robin's Lumber has a lot of those blades. They can reproduce almost anything. Wow, nice. But they've got all they've got okay, bunches of those blades that will cut. They, they used to be a guy in the chias that did those. Yeah. You know, he'd come out and take all the measurements. I mean, it's a specialty piece. Yeah. Uh, they're very they're very nice. But, um,
and then condition of the property, functional obsolescence, current cost factor. So Where are you? I have no idea. <laughs> Page 80. Page 80. Yeah. Um, current cost factor, if you look at, at all the Marshall Swift and all those guys um, in the state book, you'll find that there is a uh, cost factor in there somewhere. The trending, they might trend a little bit, but there'll be a cost factor of some sort. Um, they don't reprint all the books and all the pages. They may just do the first page that has the cost factor on it and go with that. Um, the state cost factor at one time, we don't have any yellow books here. Um, it was like 2.7 and then, yeah, is there in the front of that? That's the first page or two. Might be a cost factor. Maybe it's on the cover, maybe? It's early, in the, <laughs> it's early in the book. This is updated in 2012. Chapter one. Usually it's in the front of this book. Updated 2012. Not really too concerned about it because we're going to take our information here and we're going to price out some building, a building. Um, could have left our sketch up. Let's do this. Let's make. What is that? 36, 24. It was on a page previous. Had it up here before. Just find any first sketch you come to. Let me know. Oh, there we go. 22. 36. 36. 34 by 26. 34 by 26. He's got the sketch up for you in that book. I want to use one that's in the book. 34 by 26. Yes. And then there was a porch on the front. 4 by 6. 8 by 10. 8 by 10. Was that a porch? Mm -hmm. yeah. Our building was a two-story, with a basement, with a full basement. And then there was a one-story with no basement, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a garage. The one story was like ten by ten. Mm -hmm. Was it ten by ten? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that'll work. How are we doing so far? Don't tell my wife I can remember things because I get in trouble. <laughs> she was a Selective memory. What memory? <laughs> All right, so we've got a two story building. How big is this two story building? What's our square foot? I'm sorry. 84. Was it? 884. 884 eight, square feet. And that's a two story. Mm -hmm. So in your cost schedule, in this grid, find a two-story building. systems do, they just don't do it in a chart and a pencil or a highlighter, depending on your point of view. So on page 87, we have a two-story dwelling, 884 square feet. Let's see if we can put our finger on it. All right, but our grade is what? Grade. Grade. 3.4. 
right? Three point one four. I'm going to do this as hard as we can do it by using a decimal point. <coughs> you will see at grade. Okay, what was it? Eighty four. Eight eighty is so close. Let's just stay with eight eighty. Let's not overcomplicate this with two two axes. Axes? 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 That like marble and marbles? Somewhere. You're going to find on grade three at 880, we have a price of 14968 for a straight grade C. Okay? You see that? You not see that? Everybody got the spot? It's kind of like a depth chapter. Depth chapter. The difference between a grade C and a B, because we're above a C, is 84.830. The way I would do the math is to take 84.830, the difference between the two, and multiply it times 0.14. Makes tons of sense. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just to the left. left. Okay. To the okay. left. 84830. So just as a different side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> this red pen's not going to survive the day. So 84830. We're going to take 14% of that difference. Sixty-one five five six. Don't be impressed with the masks. So this building, this two-story building, <coughs> replacement cost would be one sixty-one five fifty-six. There's another way of solving the difference. If you don't, you know, if you have the difference and you know that you're a little above. Average, pretty sure. It's about the cleanest way to do it. In addition to this building, <coughs> reproduction cost now. Our replacement cost now. In addition to this building, we have what? Breezeway kind of thing. Basement. No basement. Does this one have a does this include a basement? The two story dwelling that I think is. I think now. Let's see if there's a basement addition or no addition here. There's a no basement deduction. That's Partial or but that's it. Ah, okay. So if there's a no basement deduction, then it sounds like this includes the basement. But we'll take off the basement on the yeah, Bingo. Okay. So let's start with <coughs> we'll keep our components straight. We have this enclosed porch. How big is this enclosed porch? 80 square feet. What's our grade to the house? 3.14? Yes. Not sure if I had an enclosed porch, I would be that good. Mm -hmm. I would live with a three. Right. Keep it less than overly complicated. If you so chose, that looks like a price per square foot too. If you so chose, you could get the difference between 5470 and 7910 and come up with 
14% of that difference and they had it on. And I have no heartburn if you want to do that. Well, we can the test you should be doing this? I'm not sure <coughs> the test is exactly right. The test will probably not give us numbers that end up that It's going to either right. be a three or four. Right. It's going to be pretty straightforward. On the house. Mm -hmm. I have no heartburn if you want to go 3.14. If you want to figure out the difference, we'll do We'll do the 14% on everything. Oh my God, how did you book the 11,876? 11,876 is the difference on page 87. Yeah. So we took 84,830 and took 14% <coughs> of the difference between the three and four. What's that? It's the breeze. So we're going to add 14% oh, from this number. Or the one that's 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 we're trying to figure out the one story. Oh, you're skipping ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we closed force. What did we decide on? So I think we decided we close seven. We're going to keep it as a three. So that is 54 seven. Oh, what's the addition? All right. One story. So going backwards to the cost schedule. How big is this thing? 100. It don't go that long. We're, we're, what are you classifying it as, though? Because we have one-story additions that okay. would cover it, and not one-story one. Where do you see one-story additions? Page uh, 90. 90. Listen, addition on. Who? Page 90. 90. 90. One-story addition. There we go. OK. Uh, grade 3, 8290. We're going to stay with that. You want to go 14% of the difference. Well, the one story addition, I would think, is probably going to be more similar to the house. So that one I would, if I was doing it myself, probably add the floor. Logical. Mm -hmm. oh, then again, some additions going to be nicer than those. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, are you counting that as an addition? Like, for this purpose, I guess we are? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. But it would be an addition without basement. It's so an addition right. without a basement. So there's something in here for mm -hmm. a basement. Yeah, so on the next top of the next page. So what would you like to do with the 14%? You want to figure it out? I did add 776. Okay, so I'm going to put $8290 plus, plus what? 776. 776. That's what the 14% yeah. of the difference was. Keeping it the same for the portion. Keeping it 5470. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Enclosed porch will sit in the 54.7. If you so chose, you could do, assuming it's all built to comparable quality in those kinds of things. I would suspect, you know, in the real world, the enclosed porch is not quite to the level of the house at that size level. Mm -hmm. um, but our one story addition has an issue. It has no basement. It has no basement. So per square foot, this is where doing the 14% makes it a little yeah, more complicated. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, but that's okay. You know, we'll just use the 2860 times 80 as a deduction. You okay, times right? 100. It's 100 um, square foot. Oh, right. Sorry, we already did the portion. 100. So 2860. Per square foot minus 100 is 26, uh, 2860. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Just move the decimal point. Yep, move the decimal point. Learn how to write all those kind of things. Okay. So we'll go there. Uh, what else do we have? We have a garage. What are we going to do with the garage? One story addition. 
Do you see any garages in our list here? We have overhead doors. Outbuildings. This is an outbuilding, isn't it? Being so All right, we will play this game. So we have an outbuilding. Wood post rocks or mud sills. Where do you find them at? Page 93. I don't know if that would be an outbuilding because it is attached. Yeah. And our town's so outbuildings mean, have to be attached. Uh, outbuildings can't be attached to another structure. Oh, it's an outbuilding. Yeah, I was going to say, when you build a tree or whatever, you yeah. can yeah. Outbuilding is an outbuilding. In Oh, yeah, okay. as a, in your, your local practices, or if it's attached, it's not an outbuilding, but no. technically it's, an un, it's not gross living area, mm -hmm. so it's not, okay. it's an outbuilding. Well, what do you do when there's, uh, when, it's, when it does have finished gross living area above it? Oh, it would not be on our chart, so we're not allowing this. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, then would you still think of it as an outbuilding? It would be yeah, it's still an outbuilding. You know, in most computer systems, it's going to be an, an outbuilding. In my computer system, I'm going to add it in as a second dwelling unit. I'm going to create a separate property card for it. The caution, we're off topic a little bit, but here's the thing. So, a two-story garage on a property by itself is the primary dwelling unit. Let's say it sells for $150,000. Let's say the building itself is $50,000. If that two-story garage with a separate dwelling unit is on another property with another house, it might have cost $50,000, but it may not contribute $50,000. Mm -hmm. Same building as a second dwelling unit on the property. Mm -hmm. if it's like the, like the mobile home. If it's its primary structure, it probably has more value than if it's an accessory building on the same property. So there's a little bit of caution there. Um, if you're looking at the entire property value, that second dwelling unit might have a functional obsolescence because it's overbuilt for the typical single family with a garage. But sitting by itself, it may have more value. But if this example was just like a, a one story over garage on that 22 by 22, say it's master suite, yeah. you would have that 22 by 22 one story as a one story addition kind of priced out, and then the right. garage part is not building mm -hmm. separate. Yeah, and, the, and the, the, if, it, if this was connected, and this is the, 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 yeah, and the this master is, suite, yeah. maybe it's just finished attic. Right. Or okay. finished second floor. Yeah. It's a little bit, it doesn't fit the form of most computer systems. It's not a two story, it's not a one story. It's kind of a finished attic, even if it's got full walls, I can go down that road. Um, maybe I'm going to call it in my outbuilding codes a two story garage mm -hmm. and then add a one story mm -hmm. other factor to it. As long as whatever we do, we do consistently throughout the town. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit of art as opposed to mm -hmm. science, you know, to, to work that out. What makes sense? Um, caution. Mm -hmm. I've seen them both ways. I have a separate code for the two-story garage on a slab with a living area above it. I built a second, you know, cave, ranch, build, um, contemporary, Item number 10, garage with GLA above. Mm -hmm. I built it separate. So, yeah, so when it's its primary structure, I've got a particular value, but when it's an accessory structure, I've got a separate code for a two story garage with finish above it. Mm -hmm. That's less than mm -hmm. the house property. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a little, you know, like I said, we're really good 80% of the time. It's, those, it's that fringe stuff, the unusual stuff. Uh, Union had a, bo had a boom of building garages with houses up above. Mm -hmm. uh, they built 10 or 12 in a two, three year time frame. Mm -hmm. 
So I said, I'm just, how am I going to fix this? Because they're not coming out. They're coming out too low without buildings. And they're not coming out right as primaries. So I created a new code, put in a factor, bump, bumped it down a little bit. I had a couple sell, which was great. Uh, again, they don't sell all the time, like a log house. So in a system like this, though, even like all your, you know, 60s, 70s splits that you yep. the garage, with the garage underneath half of it yep. on the bottom level, those would still show that, that dimension of garage in the outbuildings scheduled here and then the living spaces if it was. Um, no, well, in the house, in the house description, <coughs> it show both grade, square foot, yeah. and then it will show um, a basement garage, which is just the door. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that has value, sometimes it doesn't. And if there's any other finished area, it will be below grade finish area. But that will all be in the dwelling factor, not in that building. It will be part of the primary structure. Right. Those can be a little funny too. You don't see too many splits in them. Not new ones yeah. Secondary mortgage market, if it's below grade, any part of it is below grade finish. So the appraisers need to list that as a two bed, one bath house with a bed and a bath in the basement, perhaps, or a finished room and a bedroom. But it's got to be, you know, meets Boca code is in the, not Boca, and the Rubeck will kick in on that too. You've got to have egress for basically a firefighter with, his, with an air pack. It's going to be a certain size. Yeah. What is it? 5.7 square feet. Yeah. Is it that high? I think. I, yes, I thought it was 3.5, but I could be wrong as well. I could easily be wrong. That's what I Whatever it is, it's going to be big enough for a firefighter to get through it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for. So. There's always something. Like I said, entertainment. This is all for entertainment. All right, back to our outbuilding. It was become a little bit complicated. So, a base outbuilding, which we will use for our 22 by 22 garage, which is really goofy size, um, is 1250 a square foot. But, Wood posts, rocks, mud sills. I don't know what this one has. I'm assuming it's got a concrete floor. Mm -hmm. it's so, the house, it has to be cross protected. Yeah, gotta have something. It's cross walls, yeah. Uh, so a concrete floor down below that additions to base square base cost per square foot or bucks. Uh, foundation. Like you said, it's attached to the building. It probably's got some frost walls. I would hope so. But one of them's moving without the other. Um, so a poured concrete, I would say, if you're going to put a concrete floor in, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, foundation, walls. What is our house? Did we ever find out about the house? <coughs> vinyl siding, right? <coughs> you don't have vinyl siding. Let's assume that this had vinyl siding. 520 vinyl siding. Overhead doors, it's a 22, 22 garage. If it's got stock eight foot doors, they're in there pretty tight. Yeah. I'm gonna suggest it's got a single. It's probably one of the extra wide. Yeah. Um, well, it's still a good, it's a single, but it's a, not one door, it's a big double door. Mm -hmm. So that's a cost number, not a price per square foot. So let's add so 1260. Would you like to put a garage door opener in it? Yeah. I can tell you when I when we built our garage, we had a garage door opener. It wasn't on my door first. <laughs> so you you said um, twelve sixty. That's a double door, didn't you say? It was a well, I'm not sure door? if it means a double door or two doors that are double. Okay. Door. So you're going to. I went with twelve sixty because a twenty two foot opening is it's not going to have a single garage, door. Yeah. It's a two car garage, but it probably has one big door. Um, does it have a door opener? Hmm? Does it have a door opener? It better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> if it was built in the last and It's not on my door first. <laughs> my door Can I stop you just for a second? If you had, what if it had a single garage door, but then it had a normal like entry door? Man door. Yeah, that's a side door. Sure it does, yeah. 
Um, one common door is included in the basic specifications okay. of outbuildings. Yep. But it looks like well, there might be two doors though. One exterior and one into the interior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this yeah, you know, there could be one here, it could be one here. Mm -hmm. I would expect one to be here. Actually I'd put it over here with this next door. Mm -hmm. Actually I'd put another door right here back here. <laughs> Wish I'd done that on mine. And made it bigger, even though it's three cars. <laughs> Um, I have 2,000 square foot worth of barn too. I don't need any more space. Roof. What was the what was our house? Asphalt. Was it asphalt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so that's a dollar eighty a square foot. All right. <coughs> Interior. Twenty-six fifty. Okay, yeah, there's more in the back, Jim. Oh, jeez, I hate when there's more in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it has electricity. Just, oh yeah. my God! All of this work to look at this value seems overly necessary because it's the least value, less, so much less value than the regular house. Exactly right. It just twenty-four by twenty-two are great. See, okay, we're going. Bye. Um, interior. Is this play, is this Do we add no value for that? Because it might just be. Just stud like walls. Studs? Plywood paneling, drywall, wood, wood boards. Just that that wouldn't add any. I wouldn't Even add if any. it's a three grade house, yeah. more than likely they didn't put one. Yeah. 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 Socked up building. Um, we have a door opener. That means we gotta have. Oh, yeah. yeah. We gotta have light in there. Gotta have some power. <laughs> we like designing our house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want. <laughs> entertainment. It's always entertainment. Um, wall height, uh, geez, I don't know how high my garage is. It's going to be 10. It's going to be 10. Yeah, because the garage be door is 7, right? <coughs> it says an 8-foot eight eight is standard. The same, yeah. This guy might have a big plow truck. He wants to, you know, be able to yeah, change his yeah, tires maybe. in there. It's only 22 by 22. He can't change his yeah, mind in that no. So keep the standard. Let's, all right, let's keep the standard. <laughs> all right, so what did I say? It was 25, so 20, we to 20, 20, 26, uh, 30. Check my numbers. I've got 27.2. That's 27.2. 27, 27, okay. What was the four? 27.20. How big is our building? Sorry about the screen again. So I had um, 484. What is it? 484. 4, <coughs> 4840? Yes. Really? 484. No, 484. 484. 484. 484. No, zero at the end. That's it. 484. 484. No, zero. There you go. Oh, square foot. Yes. I was looking for a price. Okay, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't seem like enough. So what's this come out to? 13,164.8, 13, so 13,165. Oh, not yet. We also have these two add-ons. Add oh, yeah. So the two add-ons equal? 14. 14. Oh, I've got it all added up. All right, I guess. Total to uh, yeah. Yeah. Add these two. Fourteen nine thirty five. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hey, we're making progress. So. One seventy six four ninety one. Checking my numbers. So what is this? It's replacement cost. 
Oh, yep, we're going to do this one. We're almost there. We got, this is just the garage. Right? All right, what did we get over here? There's a subtraction here, too. Six for the rest of the outbuildings. Now what have we got? We have four numbers together. One eighty two, six ninety seven. Did you add this? Five. Subtract five, this. The five four seven up top there for the port. Oh, you just remove that. So what was the L buildings? Well, uh, we have four, four sections. Can we? Eleven six. Right. So that's the combination of the porch and the addition. Yep. Replacement cost new to replace that building without buildings and yep. everything. Right. It would be brand cool. new, off the shelf. So it burned down and you're replacing it. Doing the whole deal. With just what you had before. Hmm? I said you're replacing it with just what you had before. Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. But however. Uh -oh. Sorry. You have to throw this rent. Oh, yeah. <coughs> but however. What is our land value? We went out into the market and we decided. <laughs> All right, so we have a land. I think this land's worth 100000 100000 <laughs> Pick a number, we're going to get it. But we still have to depreciate our shit. Ah, shit, that was not bad. <laughs> that's our land, that's raw land. How much does it cost to develop the land? Well, septic driveway, <laughs> CMP. Where, where 70,000. 10, 10, 10, I was just picking around. 10,500 <laughs> is my base cost for my town. Oh my God, it's way too low. Yeah, we'll 30,000. 30, I like 30. Did you what? This is developed. Well, septic, CMP. Well, I just built a house. Well, it was 70 grand. You're down south. I'm in Bristol. 70 grand to put in a well septic and CMP? Oh is that the foundation? No. Take out foundation. Yeah. So it's like in our little world, well septic, um, development costs, moving the dirt around, getting it back up against the foundation, excavation, all that kind of stuff. Seventy uh, thirty thousand. So the land value is a hundred and thirty. We add the two together, we come up with oops, three. Three eighteen and change. Sound about right? Mm -hmm. One sixty seven. <laughs> We're not that good. So about three eighty to build this building new. Let's just say. However, let's say the building we're appraising is 10 years old. And let's say a building just sold, exact same thing, just sold. And it sold for 275. Where's our depreciation in the overall building? That was their mom that sold it to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but she didn't sell them at a discount. She took the full. 
She's not, a very, kid. She's not a very nice mom, and it's a lousy <laughs> kid. She's charging 10% interest. That's right. We're going to subtract out the land value because this is a relatively constant number from our data analysis. So the building, the contributory value of the building mm -hmm. is now a buck forty-five instead of one eighty-eight. What's our depreciation on this ten-year-old building? So in 10 years, this property lost about how much percent? About 23%. Just from those numbers, we don't know if it was in the garage or in the house. We just know it's from the entire structure. We'll make some assumptions that it was equitable and equal over that time frame. So this property, <coughs> a 10-year-old property in this market, is losing about 2% a year. No. Yeah, 2.3% per year. Was that on a straight line? And year 10? 23% from year zero? Did it fall in value like this? No. Probably not. Probably not like this. Mm -hmm. Will it continue to go at that rate? Probably not. Probably not. It may do something, you know, may start to flatten out for a while. On an average property, what kind of age life are you looking at before the thing is just post or minimum value? 60 years maybe. Roofs are worth 20 to 30. Foundations probably don't go away. They don't buy usually. Windows, probably got to redo them. But without any maintenance, they lost about 2.3% per year. If you apply 2.3% to all of your 10-year-old buildings based on your market analysis of the sales information, You've done your job. You can find out from the market what's going on with depreciation or with age or with something. Let's say a similar building sold, or same building just sold, and it sold at only 15%. But this building is located next to something we don't want to be located next to. It has economic obsolescence in the amount of about 8%. That's right, because you just go down trying to match that depreciation, and you just go down and you stop once you match it. Yeah, you're, you're looking for you know, that same kind of building. You know, that, my paired sales of the, of the three bedroom, two bathroom maple leaf module excellent paired sale. Do you find that every day out in the world? Oh boy, I wish I could. I can find some information. You know, I can compare old houses with new houses and I can figure out that depreciation isn't the same, but maybe the old house is a better quality for its, for its age mm -hmm. and condition than a new house that's just stock drywall and mm -hmm. uh, typical, typical new construction. Mm -hmm. My house has, I don't know, 30 doors in the inside, wooden doors, all you know, four panel solid hardwood doors. Can't replace them. I just can't go through the building and start jacking those out. Why would you want to? They still work. So this might tell you something. When you've got some sort of information, you can start working with it. If you had this property that didn't have this out piece on it, you could subtract that off and say, oh, I can add this for a garage. I can subtract this because it has one, and then compare it to 
I like building that sold mm -hmm. and make an internal adjustment and then do these kinds of percentages. <coughs> this, is the, this is the science part of it, but it's also the art part of it. How do you work so that the value that you come out with is equitable to everybody in the town with a similar property? I would love to have a bunch of these selling them. The smaller your town, the less similar, the more difficult it is to go. It's kind of out in here. And this system, I guess, can be used with mobile homes as well. Yep. And it's it's just good. You, we figure out it's a mobile home or moved home based on the grade. We don't need to factor in that part for obsolescence at all. Right. Okay. Yep. A new mobile home sells for thirty. 30 and 30, you still have a constant here. Right. 60 is your, your developed parcel. It sells for 100. It sells for 100. The building is two years old. It was new for 30. Wait a second. We're going the other way. Because it's already set up and ready to go, even though it costs 90 to do it, it sold for 100. Somebody liked something about the property. It was in great shape. It was whatever. You can go the other way. And that's the problem we have with mobile homes that the trade-in value is three grand because that's what it costs to drag it off the property. But as a functioning, useful building, even though it's 25 years old, it still may be worth twenty thousand mm dollars -hmm. because the market told you. Wait a second. It's always worth at least what your homestead is. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, had that discussion with the moral assessor before I started working with moral. Because mm -hmm. every mobile home is worth a homestead. No, it's <laughs> not part of the fabric. No. When, I looked at my, when I looked at my tax card, I thought that he had overcharged me on it, but then I look at this thing and it's like, oh, no, he, he used this book and it was right spot on. It's like exactly yeah. what my structure was, yeah. a 16 by 16. Bill, do you know, the, is the yellow book factored at all at this point? Or is it, it says 2012 on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. <laughs> it needs updating. I don't. I don't. I'm, you know. I don't know if it is or isn't. I could take it. We can figure that out later. Um, but but this entire process is not only how to do a cost approach and how to do depreciation, but you're also doing a market extraction and comparing your cost approach with what's going on in the market. And that way, you take your transmodal valuation process. And I'll, I can try to remember the name of it. Um, you're taking your cost approach and modifying it by your market approach in order to come up with equitable just value. Most of the towns do exactly this. So so, hmm? This is this is just value now. So we have now okay, right. just making sure we have now reached just value one hundred percent. All right, great. Yep. Jim, then, where did the twenty three percent depreciation come from? We took you take the 145, sorry, no. Go ahead. You take the 145, which was minusing out <coughs> the land value because you don't want that in there. Mm -hmm. And so then you take the 145 for the depreciated value minus the full replacement cost value divided, divided by that. Divided and, by 188. The difference, that was uh, 77 point 17. something percent. So the difference is a 23% loss in value compared to brand new. So this is the brand new cost. This is what the the uh, uh, building value. Uh, the building right value of the sale. Yes, the building value. The contributory value of the building to the entire sale price. Subtract out the land. Land is usually a pretty good constant. Um, when I build out. When I've done my revals, I've built out where I've got the most data, and that's my non-waterfront sales. So I come up with an extracted building value based on my non-waterfronts, and then I find that, okay, this same, using the same building cost schedule that I'm using everywhere else, like if a waterfront property sells for 400, then the difference in the waterfront property is, was it 
three two fifty five. That's my land value to the waterfront. Even if it's on 0.2 acres, it's sold for 400. My rest of my buildings in town are 145. The difference has to be the land value. Has to be. And they say, where'd you get your land value? There have been no sales. I said, I don't need any. I'm using a land residual. Or I used a building residual here. I'm using a land residual to determine the land, the, land, the value attributed to the land. If I have a land sale on the water, one acre that's vacant and it sells for 200 plus, let's say we're using the same numbers, 230, it would be worth buying vacant land putting 230 into it, putting a building on it, because you're going to get more than that out of it. It's got more value. So I would attribute this as once it's developed, maybe 230 to buy the land and develop it. But when we're done, the math is not going to work. It might be worth 330. Because you've had that uh, profit built into it or that headache going to the planning board into it, or whatever the case may be. So the math may not work, kind of like our mobile home issue, where the existing property is worth more than the parts that get it there, because of where it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder to find lakefront property than it is to find non waterfront property. You get about three chapters screwed into this thing at once. I find this tremendously exciting. No. <laughs> I bet you couldn't tell. But when you build a reval out, this is the deal. You find all those sales and you find that depreciation. You go in and pick your point that says, this is going to be my center marker. I'm going to build up and down from it. That's just value. And then applying that equitably everywhere. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but it means it's equitable. Scary, isn't it? This is all on the exam, by the way. Depreciation, depreciation is on the exam. A cost approach is on the exam. Land value, different depreciations, economic obsolescence, or uh, economic, external obsolescence. So it's possible that we'll, we would have a, a similar example where we come up with a, a, a replacement cost, mm -hmm. and they'll say, but it sold for this, and this mm -hmm. is your land value, and we're going to have to determine what that depreciation was. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? There's more to this madness than just going, you can't have your abatement. <laughs> <laughs> or, hey, this is what we can do. You've got, you know, let's put your partial, you know, put it all together as a second. We can do that. And you walk up to the property, Scar was it Scarborough? That had the vacant lot thing? Yes. Yeah, Scarborough. So Scarborough, they were subdivision lots. They were treating the second subdivision lot as an excess land instead of another primary lot. That's where they ran into trouble. The court also said in that decision, we defer some of that decision, whether a lot is a single or two, to the local assessor. If it's a subdivision lot, the law is pretty clear. 701A is very clear. You can combine them unless they are sub subdivision lots. Um, I've had people go back to the planning board because they bought a house and a lot and then they bought the one next door to it. Mostly because of one, the garage crossed the property line. I've had them go back to the planning board. The planning board giveth. The board takes away. They, amend the they amended the subdivision. They took away the line. That two little lots became one big lot. Now I've got one price as primary house lot and excess land, as opposed to two primary house lots. And they lowered the total taxes. Yep, lowered the total value, lowered the total taxes. That's a good thing to help people do. The ones I've directed people to do, it made perfect sense. They were 
you know, like I said, they, uh, one guy, one previous owner had built a workshop garage and it straddled the property line. So it didn't meet the setbacks. You may own both pieces, but you didn't meet the setbacks. Question though with, um, oh gosh, what's the term? <clears throat> Highest and best use? Mm -hmm. Since it was previously two lots, wouldn't that be the highest and best use, or, pre or do you have to just go back to just the one being one lot and treating it as that? Back to one lot, because the planning board said this is now one lot. Okay. So they don't have two lots to build on. Maybe enough land to split it off down the road where they can reconfigure the old line. Mm -hmm. But if you walk up to the property and you go, this looks like one property to me, then it's one property. Okay. We threw some common sense at the Scarborough case. And in, like some uh, devil's advocate there, though, right. how was that fundamentally so different than lots that are not subdivision lots, but like you who bought the chunk behind you and merged yep. it in, or say this, say it was one next to you and merged it in that did have frontage, your highest and best use would still be able to be sell that off if you could, if you had the frontage and the acreage to be able to sell it off as right. a separate building lot to somebody else. Okay. One could argue that yeah. that would be the highest and best use, and why are we doing rear, rear land at right. all? Because it hasn't happened. Because market. Yeah, it um, hasn't happened yet. Okay. I haven't, sure I haven't split off a second lot until I've split it off. Mm -hmm. so, and our market approach still shows us that the value it for yeah. residual land is less than right. you know, right. the building lots. Um, when they did Warren's revaluation in 92 or 3, they had um, a base lot value and then they had an additional frontage value that was 2,000. And then they had rear land value that was 2,000. And I went, <coughs> why'd you call it that? Why'd you do that? And, but what it was, when the person who did the reval in their market, because they just copied Trio into another town, in their market, extra frontage was not 2,000, it was 8,000 for that extra frontage house lot because the market said when they sell that extra frontage they're going to get more money than if it was rear land. In Maine, this is pretty rare. Um, I think it's South Portland. Was it Liz Sawyer was there before Joe? Mm -hmm. She told me once, it blew my mind, she goes, we sold the last vacant lot in South Portland. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Every lot has a structure on it. Like, That's incredible because I've got towns that are 50% vacant. Mm -hmm. um, they did just change a little bit of ordinances, so all of a sudden there were a few lots that were able to be split and divided again in the last right. couple of years. But yeah, I know that's my boggling that, to But me. that's what they did. In, in Warren, in that market where that program came from, where that setup came from, mm -hmm. extra frontage was worse on. Mm -hmm. um, and this, if there was a lot of backfilling going on, like maybe in the city kind of thing, mm -hmm. split lots off, or, or uh, Carrie's got one in, no, 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 uh, Brent's got one in Belfast. Um, you know, if you can split those lots off, they may be worth more in two pieces than one, they usually are, but maybe quite a bit more. You just don't know. But what's the market tell you? My markets, none of my markets tell me this. So I use a first acre, a second acre maybe, or a first acre in excess land. Immoral, it's a first acre and 400 bucks an acre after that. That's going to change next year. And I'm not going to bust that. You know, I'm not going to rewrite everybody and add a third acre value in there. Your first acre rear land, just go up a little bit. And, you know, swamp land, wasteland. Mm -hmm. You know, someone comes in and says, oh, that's half swamp. I'm like, okay, there you go. Not going to worry about it. You got 50 acres and 20 of it swamp, really? Okay, I can see that on the wetlands map. Okay, done. Here you go. Change the value, nothing. They've got a 22 tax rate in this little town. Not a big deal. Don't fight the things that are worth fighting. That's pretty good. Appreciation, functional obsolescence, external obsolescence. How do you find it? <coughs> structure, market approach. Number five, market approach, which is the principle of substitution. So if you had two identical ranches with two-car garage in the city of Biddeford, 
and they were comparably situated. And one was for sale for 175, and one was for sale for 165. You would probably take the 165 uh, principle of substitution. Would you buy a property comparable in that neighborhood, or would you build a property comparable in that neighborhood for 250, when you could buy something that was not maybe perfect, but at 175, you would probably do that as a substitution. Um, selling prices of comparables are uh, market approach is very, uh, very reliable. You can find out lots of good information um, when you've got sales to work with. If you're on North Haven, you're toast. You've got what you've got. Um, page 107, comparative market analysis, and comparative market analysis, the comparable property, not the subject property, is adjusted. If a comparable has superior characteristics, than a sub then, a, then a subtraction adjustment is made in the comparable. If a comparable is inferior to the subject, a positive adjustment is made. And you say, how can that be? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we're going to go to Comparative market analysis. This, yeah, this is a pretty straightforward little deal. On page 110, we have a class problem. This is quite a coincidence because this is a class. Bill's back. Problem 5.1 Determine using the data below and your own judgment the value of the following subject property. The, the subject property and all the three comparables are located in the same area. All four all properties are connected to water and sewer. They all have typically sized properties. The subject. <coughs> start filling out some paperwork. You can write in your books as you wish. The subject is located on a secondary street. With typical appeal. The house is a 22-year-old ranch. That's what all our homes are. With recent updates and is in good condition. What means good? We'll come back to that. It has a full basement. That is 50% finished. <coughs> Amenities include an open porch, in the front, a deck in the back, and a one car garage. Most important thing when you're doing a sales this is a market approach, a sales comparison approach. Fill your data in first. Comparable one sold for one fifty nine nine. Secondary street with typical appeal. I'm going to put same as the subject. The house is twenty eight years old. And is a range. Nine hundred and sixty square feet. Did our subject? Oh, subject is. Uh, excuse us. <coughs> subject is ten forty square feet. And this is nine sixty. Not quite in the right order, but that's okay. Average condition. It has a full basement that is 100% finished. Amenities include a deck. So none on the porch, deck on the back, none on the garage. Comp number two. Sold for one. 
78,000. Secondary street with its typical appeal. It's a 20 year old ranch. Eleven forty four square feet. Updates good condition. <coughs> Has a full basement. Zero finish. <coughs> Closed porch. Deck and the one Parable <coughs> three, 195. <coughs> Same location. 20 year old ranch. Thirty-two square feet. Good condition. Full basement. Twenty-five percent finish. Open porch. Deck. <clears throat> Paired sales analysis. Analysis. We mentioned that earlier. Where does our data come from? It comes from the market. Determine the following characteristics. I'd like to fill this out as we go with each comparison. $5,000 for a good location where any of these property comparables compared to the subject <coughs> to a, a location adjustment. Three, the, the third one said. Oh, three said. Better, better average. average. Oh, better than average. Ah, okay. Sorry, missed that. So it's got better than average appeal. So how do we adjust to the subject? <coughs> if it's better than the subject, what's our adjustment? Damn. Subject property is in good condition. What about comparable to an average condition? What would be our adjustment? Sounds like ours is better, so it would be. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, comparable to 20 years old, good condition. Same as the subject. Any now, adjustment? Would you assume? I mean, I guess at what point do you look at a couple years here and there? I mean, the condition is the same and it's only a yeah. couple years older, so it's close enough to be the same, though. Yeah, in the in, there are two schools of thought with appraisal work. Some people adjust for condition and for age. Not necessarily true. If you've got a 90-year-old building and a 100-year-old building, you're probably not adjusting for age, but you might adjust for condition. In this particular instance, they put the two <coughs> together all the way mm -hmm. through the, de the descriptive narrative. Mm -hmm. I would say age is not a factor, <coughs> but it's included with a condition. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in good condition. Comparable to is an average condition. Oh, where did that? Plus 7,500. Mm -hmm. um, comparable to, 20 years old, good condition. Any adjustment? 
and comparable three. $35 per square foot difference in area. So the comparable one is 80 <coughs> square feet smaller. So the adjustment would be Pause. Yeah. 960 has to adjust up to 1040. It's an inferiorly sized property. So what would be the adjustment for $35 a square foot for 80 square feet? 2,800? 2,800. <coughs> Comparable two is 1144. That's superior to the subject. We're going to make that adjustment down in the amount of $3,640. It's going to be a pretty sloppy board when we get done here. Um, comparable 3, 12, 32 square feet is superior to the subject. We're going to adjust it down. In the amount of 6720. 6720. Mm -hmm. See if we can keep these all straight by the time we're done. All right. Next little four items are uh, the basement. So our subject is 50% finished. <coughs> they all have a full basement, so we're constant there. If it's uh, comparable, one is 100% finished. The difference between 100% finished and 50% finished is. $3,000. $3, and that is a negative or positive adjustment? Negative. Negative, because we're going from 100 down to 50. Comparable number two, full basement, 0% finished. Better, so we go up. Up. 6,000. 3,000. Yeah, because it's 50% finished, we're going to go 3,000. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the third one is a full basement, 25% finished, compared to 50, plus 1,500. All right. Okay, our subject has an open porch. An open porch is 2,500. That's its value. Comparable one has none porch. What would be our adjustment? Plus, plus, 25. plus 25. Enclosed porch. We have an open porch at 25. So Comparable <coughs> two has a enclosed porch for 4,000. Do we do the plus 25 and the negative 4,000? So it would be 1,500. Net 1,500. Are we going up or down? Uh, that's better, so we're going down. Exactly right. So the difference between an enclosed porch and an open porch, 4,000 less 50, uh, 2,500 is 1,500. The enclosed porch is superior. <clears throat> so it's a negative adjustment. Comparable three has a golden <coughs> porch, same as the subject. Any adjustment? No. Okay. The deck. It says fifteen hundred dollars for a deck. Does everybody have a deck? Yes. yes. No adjustment. There's some discussion on whether what's a deck and what's a deck. Um, I do make a difference in valuations for decks. A low quality deck could be just pine on you know, close to the ground, on joists, an average quality is pressure treated. Um, superiors, we're starting it into <coughs> uh, depending on how much they are. Um, I've seen some decks put in one comes to mind in Union at $8,000 for a deck. I'm like, whoa, that was a lot of money. 
It's a good sized deck too. Uh, that was all composite. Hmm. Um, Jude and I are pricing out, we're going to replace the decking, but not the joists and all that stuff. So we're going to put in composite decking. Mostly because you just have to power wash it. You did that at my camp, it's awesome. Yeah. You put it 16 on the center or 12 on the center? Um, I think that was 16. 16. There's some discussion on that. You may have to put an extra joist across. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, was, I think I was 16. Um, okay, garage. We have a one car. One car is worth five thousand. A two car is worth nine. So comparable one needs an adjustment. Four thousand. Five thousand to be. Because they're starting out with window or garage. I mean, I was going to be. I'm sorry. I entered the So we're making an adjustment. The screen's in the way again. <laughs> <coughs> What's our adjustment? Plus 5,000. Plus 5,000. Plus 5,000. Makes perfect sense to me. Comp number two, one car, one car. Mm -hmm. Two car versus one car. This is where I was going. Is there this you 4, go. Is this is the difference between the two of them. I knew you'd be right eventually. <laughs> Twice a day. <laughs> yes. If it's a broken clock, it's a twice a day. That's right. But is that you put between two? Okay. So we've taken our subject property. We've got our three pretty decent comparables. Hmm. So what kind of adjustment of values are we looking for here? Comparable one. So I'd like to get two numbers for you. The net adjustments. And then what the gross adjustments are. The gross adjustments would be ignoring any negatives as a subtraction. So the net adjustment is what we're going to use for uh, our valuation process. So in this particular case, so you ignore the negatives? Is that what you're saying? For Gross adjustments, yes. So what do you have for a net adjustment, which is a positive? So that's adding, we're subtracting all yep. of the So plus, right? plus, minus, plus, plus. 14,800. 14,800. It's the net. We'll come back to gross in a second. Let's just do the nets for the moment on all, all right, of these. So, uh, yeah. so nets again is everything. You add and you subtract. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So gross is just every number? If you like start. Total? Correct. Okay. Absolute value. If you start with your sales price and then add and subtract everything, the total you get would be your adjusted sales price, and then the net would be the difference between that adjusted and your original sales price. Four, the same as those things added up, right? Come back to why we do nets and gross. And 
then once you get that in gross, give me a percentage. I, I, I honestly have to say I've lost you. Yep, okay. I'll come back. I'm going to figure it all out. Okay. Okay. Are you looking for a percentage of what the adjustment is? Yep, you you net percentage? and gross. Why are you turning it into a percentage? Uh, we'll come to that. Put a, a percent from the sale price of what the adjustment is or from the? Yes, from the sale price. I'll come back. So the net adjustment would be plus 2,800, plus 7,500, minus 3,000, plus 2,500, plus 5,000. Gives us a net adjustment of 1,480. So the net adjustment is just all the positive. Positive and negatives. Oh, okay. Yeah, positive, positive, so, negative, positive, positive. Okay. Gives us a net adjustment. All right. A gross adjustment is adding 2,800 and 7,500 and 3,000 and 2,500 and 5,000 together. All positive, is it? ignore the negative sign. It's a gross adjustment. A gross adjustment is, oops, that's the wrong number. Miss added 20,800. So in, in example, in comp one, we have a net adjustment of 1480, which is 9.3%. We have a gross adjustment of 2800, 20,800, with a gross number, a gross adjustment of 13. We'll come back to why that is in a second. So <laughs> gross, gross is we're trying to see just how much add all the numbers. So we know how a gross is lives. add all the numbers together. Gross add. Net is <coughs> add and subtract where indicated. So why would you not get the percentage change from the sale price and then the adjusted price? We're not, yeah, not the adjusted price. Okay. Yeah. So we're not, <coughs> not the adjusted so, price. So no matter whether it, okay, so, so then the gross is like, in, it would be the 2,800 plus 7,500 plus 3,000. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, plus, plus 25, plus. plus. Yep. That's because you're trying to see how comparable it really is, like how many things exactly. are different, so we know how much validity okay. need to weigh on that comp, right. that sale. Mm. So in comp one, we've got a 9.3% net adjustment, 13 gross. In comp two, we have a 1.2% adjustment and 4.57, 4 4.6 gross. In comp three, 5.2% adjustment, 6% gross. I got a different number than the 10, 220. I did too. I think you forgot to add the 4,000 at the bottom. I think that's how oh, it was. Yep. It was just 4,000 off. So I'm assuming that's where it came from. Yep, yeah, so that should be 14. negative 14. Yeah, I missed that 4,000. Exactly right. So what does this come out to? 72%. Seven point three. I I got. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Seven point three. Seven point something. Seven point three. Three percent. Yeah. 
And then gross was a little bit more. Yeah, I was wondering that too. Yeah, I missed the 4,000. So are we just doing gross just because cause it's not on the... Right. It's not on the sheet. That's what's... It's just yeah, that's what I did. We're going to get there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, need, we'll need to know the gross. Okay. You, you will need to grow the gross on Friday. Uh, what was the total? So it's uh, <coughs> 14,220 plus... So in comparable number one, we're going to add 1480 to the original sales price, sold for 159.9, and we're going to add 14,800 because of our positive and net adjustment for an indicated value of 174 south is our adjusted sale price. And comp number two, now subtract 2,140 for an adjusted sale price of 175,860. We'll come to these adjustments in a second. Comparable three sold for 195. We had to the net adjustment was down from the subject. Oops. So it has an adjusted sale price. Of 170, 180 and change. The net and gross adjustments are important. It's mostly a banking standard. It's not in uniform standards professional appraisal practice. But it's mostly a banking statement uh, standard where if even though you have a relatively small amount of adjustments, the gross was higher. It might indicate that you've made too many adjustments to a non-similar property if your gross adjustments are, are fairly significant. I think the banks throw them out if it's more than 20%. If you approach 20%, yeah. they don't want to see it. When I was doing appraisals, it was 15 net and 25 gross. Mm -hmm. May have changed a little bit since then. But that's what the banking system, the secondary mortgage market we talked about, that's what they're talking about. If your adjustments are, you know, you might have a, you know, we've got 13% adjustments here. Is comparable one the best one? Because we've done a lot of pluses and minuses. Is it the best available comparable? You might have to go to comp number four, five, and six, and eight, and ten to say, yeah, this was this looked good when I started, but when I ended up, it was pretty high. But you might have another comp that might be a little bit older in the same neighborhood, but might have less adjustments. So excluding the time difference from when it previously sold might be a really good sale. It might be right next door to the subject on the same <coughs> subdivision. Might be perfect, but you know the lending institution doesn't like anything over six months old and a mile away. In Maine, good luck with that. All of the costs are more than a mile away. Just can't do it. So we're looking for gross and net to tell us something. Do we have the best comps available? How many comparables does it take under uniform standards of professional appraisal practice? How many comps does it take to have a credible report? Well, for the five. <laughs> it could be. 
as many as it takes. As many as it takes is actually the right answer. It's not a number, it's a direction. So how did you get the, the gross is just the positives? Just no, it's, it's, it's all positive. the numbers. It's the absolute I value. Know. Absolute value. Ignoring okay. negatives, it's an absolute value. More We're, negative or positive. And then the net is? With the negative taken out. Okay, so the net's just the positives. Yeah, the net's, the net's a positive minus the negatives. The gross is? The positives minus the negatives? Yeah. Would yep. that be the, the actual gross? addition? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's normal gross. addition for the, for the first part, and then absolute values, and then it, it, those absolute values together to get your gross. Your gross is just a, a measurement of how many changes you've made. Whether there are changes up or down, there's still a change. So the gross is just the value of the changes or the adjustments, regardless oh, of what okay. direction they go in. Okay. So we can just see how dissimilar it was. Okay. We'll, hit, we'll hit absolute value on the sales ratio study uh, when we get the deviations. Because those are all just absolute So value. much easier when you can figure out why we're looking for what we're looking for. <laughs> makes it make sense to have yeah. Yeah. All the three added together. Fortunately, this is good information. If you don't have a nice big sales ratio study to work with, but you've got a couple of sales to work with, and you're trying to figure out the, the price of a property, you can do a pretty good job at it. The state will use appraisals if there's not enough sales information. I think that's kind of a waste of time because it's just recycling in all your sales information to come up with a comparable number to reuse back in your sales ratio study. So you're kind of you're making soup with the same ingredients. You haven't had anything new to your sales <coughs> study soup. So I have seen. Go ahead. I'm just trying to figure out what I have compared to what's up there and where I may have made some mistakes, but you carry on with the so story first. So why this overly complicated system of finding percent. I understand the, the reason for the gross, to figure out how w different it is. But if you have things within a reasonable gross, why not just add the three together and then divide by three and find your average? Why not do that? Not usual practice. Okay. Is it, what, is it, does it lead to a drastically different answer? It or? could. Okay. Yeah. You might end up overvaluing. I look at this and I think, what's my best comp based on my percentage adjustments, my best comp? This one point two net, four and a half gross, thirteen gross, eight gross, not quite as good, superior. This Where would be my best indicator of value. So what would you what would you then say that the subject house is worth? One seventy six, or okay. one seventy five eight. Can can we just go over what our net adjustments are and then gross adjustments and then the percentages because I'm having a hard time following it on the board there yes. and I'm missing numbers That's somewhere. Pretty sloppy work up here. On the well, board. it's just finding where it was because I wasn't yeah. looking when you wrote it. So All comp right. so one was fourteen one. on the net adjustments. Right. So it was plus twenty eight hundred, plus seventy five hundred, no. minus three thousand. Mm -hmm. Plus twenty five hundred, plus five thousand. So fourteen thousand eight hundred. It's fourteen thousand eight hundred net. And our gross is twenty thousand eight hundred. Right. Okay. So our percentages then are net. It's actually nine point two three. I okay. think. And thirteen point zero one. I'm good there. It's okay. the next one that I'm trying to. So minus thirty six forty. Mm -hmm. Plus three thousand. Minus fifteen hundred. That doesn't come up to 2,140? That's what I have. I get 2,140. Okay, and that's 1.2. It's the next one I know. Okay, so then the gross on that one. I only had four points. So if you add for gross, 3,640 plus 3,000 plus 1,500. Oops. Now the computers don't like starting off with a negative number. Plus, that's why I have to have trouble with it. 3,000 plus 20 or hmm? 1,500. But yeah, I did 2,500 plus 4,000. On this last one. Oh, good. So it should be 4,000. Well, I, I did the 2,500 and the 4,000. I did them as two ones with the 1,500. But yes. Oh, okay. But doesn't that, that, that come out to 13,140? Right I got 8,140. I got 8,140. Eight eight yeah. Okay. That's where I got so once you get the gross adjustment, how do you get that percentage? Take the, the gross total mm -hmm. divided by the selling price. 
Okay. I did that for the first one, and I didn't get the same number. Uh, I mean, I had a 9.23 or something. I got 11.3 for the first one. 11.3%. Here? Oh, I have a different I believe, yeah. I don't know. Okay. What did you just say? What the growth the percentage for the first one? Thirteen. Which one? Thirteen. The second one. For the growth. Oh, that was the main one. So there's, there's the first one. There's the ninth one. Yes. Below those, there's the thirteen. Oh, I didn't write them. Oh no, sorry. Okay, that's why I was confused. Okay. Like I said, when I started, I knew it was going to be more. It's not really as good as I'm like. And you don't have to actually stop in there. Yeah. Um, so the conventional like, is 15 net, 25 gross. But that's not a that's a banking standard. It's not a use cap standard. It's not an appraisal standard. 25 gross. It may have changed. I was, somebody said 20. So. In a busy market, we should be able to get pretty tight. In a slow market, mm -hmm. now you're starting to do time adjustments, maybe. Um, that could be a little bit problematic. So you're just looking at the comparables and saying, just eyeballing them, saying, OK, my subject is 176. Yeah, that's the most, most, most comparable. Seven, 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 and again, all these adjustments are based on paired sales analysis. If you can find a pair of sales analysis that fills up a page like this, good power to be on here. You know, it's, awesome. right. but it's hard to find. It. In our particular instance, <coughs> we're using some sort of a cost number from, you know, this is what a garage costs, and we add that to the ranches. Okay, it's not too bad. Um, you know, you still have to start. When I do a, a, a revaluation, I'm looking for the cleanest three bedroom. Two bath, relatively new ranch or cave I can find. Without decks, without the largest, as clean as I can get. And that's probably what I'm going to aim for on the sales ratio study. I'm going to say, okay, that sold for 150,000. Uh, manipulate, manipulate, try to recompute. No, nope, a lot of higher. No, nope, lower. Okay, 150, 150, 100%. That's my marker. It's my cleanest sale. And then I'm going to build up and down from there. So I'm looking for the best piece of information I can. I just want to make sure I'm totally clear. So you've got your numbers. You look at your different ex your different adjustment percentages, and basically you're going to pick the value of the comp that's closest. That's my my uh, adjusted sale price of what I think this subject property is. My value on it based on these others because of what my adjustments are. So I don't do any averaging of them. We just say it's this one, and then I explain why because that's all I was presented with. Right. What's so my reconciliation? Comp. Why did I say the subject property is worth this? Comp two was right next door. It sold 30 days ago. It's the least amount of adjustments. It's got the same color in the bathroom. Good to go. Are there ever instances because? and it just works out, happens to work out in this, comp two, which is the lowest percent, also has the least number of adjustments. Yep. So that's what the percentage that's is. That's pretty measuring. common that those will yep. fall they in have line. To, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what it's a measurement of. Yeah. You could have one adjustment, but it could be $40,000. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You could have that. But it has, you know, that could play into it. It's not an exact science. Right. You know, we could, mm -hmm. come to, we could average those, 175, 176, 180, it might be 177. Is that much different than 176? Probably not. Um, Dad and I always, we, we went to the nearest 500. Now that's what the market might tell us. Some people say, oh my god, you are just, no, that's the number right there, 860. I'm like, the market doesn't sell for 860. It sells for 176, 175, 175, 5 maybe. But it doesn't sell for 860. That's why I round off to the nearest 100. I ran off more than that and just start messing around with the tree because our numbers are too small. So I use the nearest center. Hmm. Is it perfect? No. You gotta pick something somewhere along the way. I see these towns that you know are all the way all the way out to the ones place 
and then a mill rate of 13783 and I'm like you are not that good except Matinicus. But they're supposed to use that overlay to round out that number, <coughs> that mill rate number. Right. That's what I say. Just, you just keep you know, you keep rounding off at some point. Uh, there's no point to be perfect. You try. But. Now, would you always m kind of merge or um, compress all of the different um, enclosed porches and decks and everything into one figure? Or like, I, I had, was writing it down as you know, I'm adjusting for an enclosed porch, and then I'm adjusting for. Um, an open porch, and so that was kind of two separate, you know, one had one and one didn't have the other. I kind of did that in, as two separate adjustments. They still net out the same, but w so if you're looking at your number of adjustments, I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Um, yeah, if there are different components in a building, I would keep them separate. Okay. okay. If it, you know, that makes sense that, to that me. Like a, you kind of the merged them together in this because they were on the yeah. same like row, but they're kind of like a, you might see the appraisal reports where they've gone, you know, deck and porch, and then they've done yeah. something over here. Right. Kind of merged them. I would keep them separate. This is going to be clear. Um, let him go ahead. I'm Mike. What topic? All right, you kind of answered already, but like, uh, so when it says subject value, so we would just round up by 175, 860 to 176 for that? Yep. Okay. 175.9 is good. Okay. okay. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. Whatever you think, whatever you think, it's good. You're in the ballpark, you know. If somebody, if some bank person, you know, someone out in a cubicle in South Carolina says, oh, you should have put the exact number in there, I'm like, you know, why don't you come up to me and we'll have a talk about it. Well, we're not doing it for banks. We're doing it for, our, right. we're doing it just to kind of help our cost schedules. So right. we're, we're close <coughs> enough to be able to make those judgments. Right. Yes, you know, like we said earlier, Appraisal work is done for a different purpose and function yeah. than assessment work. Yeah. They're not the same numbers, and they shouldn't be. Where are we finding these numbers from that call it says paired sales analysis? Are we going right. to go over that later, or is that just kind nope. of, where do we find that, num where do we get those numbers in the wild? Let's just say. The transfer uh, tax forms. <laughs> yeah, comp one and comp two are exactly the same, except for um, uh, the finished basement, and so comp one sold, I'm gonna make these numbers up, for 100, and it's got a finished basement of 100%. And comp two, it doesn't have a finished basement. <coughs> so what was the difference? $6,000, is that what it was on the paper? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so $6,000, this is 0%. And comp two sold for ninety four thousand, and the only thing different was the finished basement. And you said the difference was the finished basement six thousand dollars. I guess I don't understand how you can get that number because we're looking at comparable sales over here, and they're all like a you know more than a mile away from each other. And yeah. It just seems like finding the initial number to start off doing this is incredibly complicated, and we're not. It's dumb luck. Okay. Like it's I said, just dumb luck. Okay. It is dumb luck. And it's mass appraisal, though. You it's you might have seen appraisal. like ten different paired sales over the last five years that all come close to the six thousand numbers. That's just what you're using right. on all of them. You're not looking for what happened in the last two months. Right. It'd be in, it, incredible to find a finished basement adjustment of six thousand dollars. Right. Not that number, but just the difference. Um, I'd have more luck with a house without <coughs> a garage and a house with a garage. That would I've had better luck with. Probably find that in my market. Um, it may not be the same age. You know, the example I use is perfect. These buildings were built two months apart, or they landed two months apart. And somebody did stuff to one, and the other one didn't have anything. Just, I guess, when you find the like, okay, so you're taking the comparable sales from other properties and not necessarily your subject or your comparable. Mm -hmm. yep. They're just these are just. This could how, be this could be two capes. How many? Sales need to be go throughout a year in a town in order for this to be a viable system, or does it really just all depend on how fast the sales are happening? Depends on if you had two similar sales, yeah. they could be a year apart. Okay. My philosophy is even if they're a year apart and they have a very distinct difference, my market probably hasn't moved that much in a year's time. I'm going to hang my hat and say, I'm going to make an adjustment for six thousand dollars, even though these sold a year apart. The only difference was a finished basement. That's the number I'm using. 
as long as you use it very if equitably. You, if you don't, there you go. If you don't have sales like that, you know, say you don't have sales like that because you're very remote and whatever. Yep. But you know that Joe Schmo just put a basement in and it cost eight thousand dollars. You could use cost as long as you're going to be equitable in applying that new cost of Joe Schmo's new basement to everybody that has a uh, has a. Well, Joe basement. Schmo had one for eight, and Henry down the road had one for nine, so you can take like an average. You could take an average. Yeah. 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 Or it's going to be different on a house that's you know. But you apply that to everybody in right. town, right? right? Regardless of whether it was nine or right. six, basically. Right. So maybe you figure out that, okay, using those numbers, it was $20 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So then you can say, I'm going to apply $20 a square foot to everybody who's got a finished basement. And someone's going to say, no, it was 1940. I'm going, yeah, okay, whatever. The important thing is if you're using the 6000 for a finished basement now, and then you do an analysis that looks different, and you say, oh, it's really 8000 you have to go through all of the ones that have finished basements in your home to have it in your town to be... Right. The 8,000, when you change to 8,000, you don't just change the ones you're looking right. at from then on out. That's what we were talking about earlier. It's yeah. hugely important to have quality data to start with. Mm -hmm. But stuff still happens. Yeah. You know, just because we missed a finished basement doesn't mean we didn't treat everybody equitably. We just didn't know. Mm -hmm. No one's going to fault us or shouldn't for not knowing that Joe Schmo finished up his basement. Um, sometimes I get invited to people's houses and I go, yeah, I did not know there was an extra bathroom here. <laughs> well, I found a few just oh, recently yeah. that had finished basements previously that have been torn out that aren't there anymore. Yeah. And I found, you know, two in the last six months that were on yep. tax cards still that had been removed. Yep. Because so they flooded or they was damp or they yep. got moldy because they foreclosed mm -hmm. on or right. whatever. Or whatever, yeah. Yep. That's why um, we come. That's, that's why we want to update the records. Yep. And, and, and it's, it's a true that you know, some of these components just don't add cost value. They add mm -hmm. something less than cost value. Yeah. Um, you know, the theory of contribution, which is in our stack of principles, is fairly important. You know, just because you have eight sheds doesn't mean you've added eight times the shed value to the value. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe you add one shed and you go, the rest of them are economically worthless. Oh, it's, a, it's a super adequacy. I'm going to put them at zero, make a note in your cart. How come I'm not assessing the other seven? Because there's another seven. How many sheds do you want to see on the property? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, i got to pay more for a property because there's eight sheds. You know, yeah, maybe if no. there was two, but... Yeah. <laughs> two. Well, then it becomes like an eyesore. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, exactly. So how does that work into your equation as you get down through the process? Um, there's some common sense out there. What you know, like, what do you need with the eight thousand square feet of deck? Now, most of them are seven hundred, eight hundred. Band. Joe could come play. <laughs> you know, who knows? But you know, that's a real super adequacy, and the cost on that is going to be tremendous. You know, um, uh, plastic boards are thirty bucks a piece, or something like that. Thirty-two dollars. <coughs> I need twenty-two of them. <laughs> That's what I know. I'm going to need more than that because we're going to do a bullet or so it looks sharp. Yeah. Make sure you pay attention to how you install that. Exactly right. That's why I'm going to practice on the back kitchen step before <laughs> I do the front porch. Yep. The front porch you know, needs a new decking. I'm going to practice on the back one. I'm going to order a couple extra boards because you know what's going to happen. That yeah, wasn't cut right. Yes, dear. Okay. Don't be the foreman. Go get your hat. So. It's all good. We're going to skip over income approach. I'm going to do that Thursday because I really want to do sales comparison. Everybody's running out of steam anyway. I can feel it. It's time to dig down deep. It's a lot to take in. Lot to take in. To We're going sales to ratio studies. Sales ratio studies, which I think is number seven. One twenty-seven. Um, let's do. Let's not get too clever. Let me touch on this tomorrow morning too. And just slow him down a little bit. Or speed him up. 
A sales ratio study is the absolute kicker for everything we do. Um, if you've got good ratios and if you've got good data and you've plowed them into your system or pen and paper or pencil or whatever you've got going, you put that information in there and you've got good data, which is what a reval usually solves. It's not that your values are wrong, it's that your support for those values are incorrect. Somebody has not done you know, the building permits over the last five years or something. You don't save money by not um, what I refer to as management by wandering around, which is to go out on the planet and drive the roads and see, did they build that building? Did they build that shed? Did they tear something down? Um, when a property sells, they go to the property, go to find out. I'm qualifying. The sales ratio study. I'm looking at all of those sales and saying, Okay, is, there, is it really what I think it is based on my records? Was it remodeled and I didn't know about it? Did they tear down the garage? And I just had someone call me up and say, that garage has not been there for four years. I'm supposed to get a demolition permit so I can know. Just call me up and tell me. I'll come you know, drive right by. I'll notice. Uh, we want to know, I want to know what's on the face of the earth. Because I'm trying to qualify those sales. <coughs> Because ultimately, what the town pays for county and school is going to be based on that information. I want it to be as accurate as I can get. And it's still not perfect, but we do give it a shot. On page 129, I draw your attention to average deviation. You'll see just above that, the average deviation is calculated by summing the deviations of all the sales ratios and dividing by the sum of the total number of the sales ratio of that study. You'll notice on this that Deviation is derived from subtracting the sales ratio the average of the sales ratio compared to what that specific sale deviation Yes. I just checked the math. So that is on this right now. So in the in the column up above, you'll see the sales assessed value, sales ratio, and then deviation. I would like to have seen a column that said 72% between the sales ratio and the deviation. Because you're going to take the sales ratio of 60 minus 72 equals a deviation of minus 12. However, the deviations are expressed in an absolute value. They're neutral. They're, yeah, they're yeah. neutral. We just had that problem. Mostly because I can't write. That's okay. So 60 minus 72, 74 minus 72 is negative 8. We're going to put absolute values in the deviations. Um, yeah, I would have liked to have seen that in there. You total the deviations, which is 67. And you'll see in this example, <coughs> the top two and the bottom two have been uh, uh, segregated from the main, the main herd. This looks like a uh, land sales. Um, the average deviation is 67 divided by 12. So the average <coughs> ratio is 72, which is an average of the central tendency, numbers 3 to 10. So if you take 70, 71, 71, 71, 71, 72, 73, and 75, add those together, divide by 8, you will get 72. And then you subtract 72 from the, all of the uh, data points in the sample to get the deviation. Like I said, we're going to touch on this and then do it tomorrow. The average deviation, though, they include the outliers, whereas to find your average sales ratio, you're just using your central range. Correct. That's going to trip me up. Yep. 
That's why I was trying to say it as cleanly as I could. Mm -hmm. You restated it perfectly. Can you say that again? Mm -hmm. So the average deviation includes the um, outliers. It includes all of your outliers. It's the average of all of them. Whereas your average sales ratio is only your central range. It does not Correct. use your outliers. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. I won't expound on that at all. Restate it correctly. You'll see in my little cheat sheet that says that as well. How do you determine how how many to knock off on your ends when you have? Is it just what's the? It'll be it's the bottom of the next two pages. Right? See what it says. <coughs> we always have this discussion. Seventy percent. So. I'm going to take the going to take the total the total number of is 12 okay. times 15 percent. That's how much you. That's how many you take off. Right. Okay. 15 percent on the top, 15 percent on the bottom. Correct. To leave you with your middle 70. Got that's it. correct. But what's really yep. crazy, because to me this is totally not intuitive, and I knew we were doing this it's today, which is why I tried to read it. But you always round up. So if your 15 percent says it's 8.4 outliers you round to nine outliers, right. whereas normally your brain's gonna tell you that would be eight. But you need an even number, so it actually goes to 10. So you're gonna take ten off, five <laughs> off the bottom and five off the top, right. Right. which is to me totally not intuitive. So it's I like intuitive. threw big stars all over that yep. because okay. that, ex that example really is, yep. I think. The more really sales you have, the better off you are. Because yes. then you're actually, so these are the qualified sales that we've decided are out of everything is good, out of everything that's good and bad, we've taken the good. And then we're going to take the good and we're going to take 15% off the top and 15% off the bottom and still say statistically those aren't as good. When you're using 12 sales, like in the state of Maine, and you have a diverse housing market, mm -hmm. it's best to take the outliers off. There's a lot of discussion, IAAO standards, the international. They use all sales in the universe. They don't oh. right. lop off the bottom. There are some states that uh, prescribe to that. They just use all the usable sales instead of, mm -hmm. but we used to take 25% off the top and 25% off the bottom and use the central 50%. Just because Maine has such a range of. Yeah, it has such a range and a lot of the towns yeah. are very small mm -hmm. and they have limited number of sales, especially in a one year period. Mm -hmm. Due to state valuation, some towns it takes me three years of sales to buy 12 mm. usable sales. So, so we can not use multiple years of sales? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but you just have to be careful right. Right. of escalating, inflating, and deflating markets because they right. may be ch they're changing rapidly, like yeah. you know, right. so mm -hmm. percent a month yeah. or something like that, 12% a year, which we are right on the cusp of happening in many areas of the state, Right. some areas of the state. So yeah, there's yeah, there's a degree yeah. of caution, like I mentioned with North Haven. You know, we went back. Timmy and I went back five years for twelve good sales, and that's all we had. That's all we can yeah. do. Um, I will, and I will do what Mike was suggesting. Is I would take this sales ratio study and do it on all of them, not exclude anything. What strikes me in this sales ratio study, we'll go. We'll just stick with theory today. What strikes me in the sales ratio study is the number, the last one at twenty four percent kind of sticks out away from the 12 to 13 everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the one I want to ditch. Mm -hmm. Maybe for some reason it's it really snuck in there. Thing. Maybe it's a nine acre sale that qualifies, but everything else is a one acre sale. Um, I tend to stick with um, main buildings. Um, I will do, um, when there's a tree growth sale, I'll convert my assessed value to full value without the tree growth, and I'll put that in. I'll mark it in green on my, on my Excel that says, all right, it's a tree growth sale. I'm gonna keep it in here because it's a large land acreage that might tell me something. All my large, large lake acreages are hanging to the bottom or hanging to the top. That tells me something. You know, maybe my rear land is overcooked or undercooked. I need to change those values. Um, you know, this town's at 72. You know, again, that, that number 12 kind of sticks out as being a little bit of a goofy sale. Um, average ratio at the top of 130. 
is exactly that. As Lena just said, that's the average of the sales in the central 70% of the central section. But that number is subtracted from the entire sample. Uh, classification, central range, certified ratio, declared <coughs> ratio. Primary goal of a sales ratio study is determining municipality's assessment ratio. So a town might be technically at 91%, their certified ratio could be 100. So that's what the local assessors said. We're going to certify at 100, we're allowed that. Um, we're at 90%, can we certify at 99? Yeah, you can, but it really sloppies up your exemptions and all that other stuff. And I try to stay away from that. I, I would be more upset of having a 90 than I would be at 92. I'd rather be at 92 than 90. Um, and, and the auditors from the state, they're really cool about that stuff. Um, you know, they're not trying to um, help a town or hurt a town. And, most of the auditors, believe, Mike, they tend to do the same school district, right? Tend to, but tend to. the way I was in RSU was in 2005, six, and kind of muckied up the waters a little bit. Yep. Right now with the turnover. They, oh, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah, you can see people within, different people within school districts and so forth. So so there's a, there's a consistency to making sure that a town doesn't get dinged in a positive or negative manner. Trying to be very consistent. Um, you know, if there's some reason, you know, if a sale hurts a town, they'll probably toss it out, you know, depending on the quality of what's going on. Um, just to make sure that, you know, the town's not getting, a, you know, going from 90 to, you know, a big change in the ratio. If they look at all of the sales ratios and it's showing that overall the assessment is only say 92% of um, you know the, the actual turnaround document would come out at 92% the town can still say hey we, we want to certify at 100 as long yeah. as it's within that within 10% of the and actual the, and the state will kind of approve what the town is yep they'll approve that right. okay. no problem at all it doesn't actually, the certified ratio isn't necessarily what the turnaround document calculated. Right. So certified ratio is a misnomer. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's declared ratio, really. Yeah. yeah. I should say, but the law refers to certified ratio. Okay. Certified ratio come back when there was a state tax, and they actually traveled around the state uh, Bureau of Taxation at the time, traveled around and actually certified your commitments, the mm -hmm. commitment papers. That all the assessors used to, July, August, to September, used to have to gather in a, in a county house or something and mm -hmm. come in there, and the state tax assessor would take their stamp and jibble, mm -hmm. jibble, jibble. Yep. Okay. That's, that's where the term certified came from. Okay. Oh, yeah. So they were, yeah, yeah then it was your certified. certified. It's, kind of, yeah, it's kind of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's your declared ratio. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because when you get your ratio declaration mm -hmm. in the spring for your homestead exemptions, it mm -hmm. gives you the ratio that was developed at the most recent state valuation. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, you, you can check off a box and submit new information if it's mm -hmm. pertinent. Yep. I mean, if you have a reval or the market took a dive and you, your current ratio is coming out, you can petition to have certified. If you were at 90 last year and they only said you can only go to 99, and you geez, at one percent. Now you do a ratio study of the current sales, mm -hmm. and it indicates that you're actually at 92 because the market declined. You could submit that yep. for evidence and certify 100. Yeah. I've done revals in between, and I've just mm -hmm. submitted the new sales ratio that I've done. And mm -hmm. Linda's like, yeah, no problem. But if you did your turnaround document and it was coming in at like you know 85, you can't then go to the and declare 100 because the state's going right. to say, eh, eh, that's more than 10 percent. Yeah, you're you're still going to get reimbursed on. Yeah. There are towns that give reimbursements on 100. I mean, their exemptions on 100, but they don't but get the reimbursed getting, on right, 100. Right, exactly. Right. So yeah. they, the they've got a shortfall already yeah. built into their commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 you know it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, mill rate comes out, it comes out. That's what it is. I don't. Give it any thought whatsoever. I don't care what the mill rate is. Um, I care a lot when it goes up because I'm the one who's going to get the beating. But if the market is is 
going up, so your so your sort of kind of your ratio is kind of trending downwards. And you've moved then the it's actually up. more beneficial if you say you haven't done any little mini revals yet. Yeah. It's kind of more beneficial to your residents to try to certify towards the top end of that because then they're right. they're able to keep those exemptions up and whatnot right. rather yeah. than saying okay yeah we're only coming in at you know eighty six now and you know. So well, change. Going to ten percent range. Yeah. A lot of people don't, but it is beneficial for your taxpayers. Yeah. Um, when I redid Searsmont's land values, I upped the land values about fifteen thousand, mm -hmm. but the exemption went to a hundred, and some people, even with the value increase, went down in taxes mm -hmm. because we we're able to do that little flip. It's right. a small number, but it, the mm -hmm. math was just right. It was a good time for a reval, as far as not hurting. Yeah. Not having. No, we've been certifying right a hundred percent. We've been right spitting distance of 100. It's a very dead market, or very slow moving consistent market in mm -hmm. Sears 1. And that's terrific. I like that. Mm -hmm. Makes my life easy. Absolutely. Yep. Um, a yeah. whole bunch of other things. The median, the median value is the value at the midpoint of the range. So if you look on 129, our midpoint, we got 12 sales, somewhere between 6 and 7, 71%. So the median, it's an, it's an interesting number, so this is not the last number to worry about. But if your median is 72, or 71 in this case, and your average is 84, probably your sales ratio study's got something goofy in it. Something, something's kicking that number up, the average up too high, even though your midpoint is 71, or in vice versa. You know, maybe there's something that's pulling your average down. Probably there's a bad sale or two or three in the mix. Or something really simple I've seen where the decimal point landed in the wrong place and it didn't quite soar correctly. And it kicked it out and went, wait a second, I gotta fix that, the ratio is wrong. Um, the median is a nice number, same as the mode. You know, it's an interesting number but it doesn't tell you necessarily what you really need to know. But it can be a little bit of a marker that tells you that not everything's as nice and perfect as you'd like it to be. Um, as I mentioned, I do my own sales ratio studies. I don't drag them out of trio or pick that out. You know, qualified, I put everything. Um, that looks like something of a qualified sale um, into Excel, build it out, see where it spits, start putting red boxes on the garbage, start putting green boxes on the tree growth, start going, oh, that yellow one, I don't know why that is. Oh, here's something, and then start <coughs> take that bunch of information and sort it out by type of property, ranches, capes, colonials, double wides especially, waterfronts especially, and sort them out and recompute those little pieces, copy, paste, and drop it into something else, and see what those ratios are. If you're at 90% on your non-waterfronts and at 60% on your waterfronts, you've got inequity, period. Needs to get solved. You're unfairly discriminating against a class of properties. It's easy to lose those abatement appeals. Real, real easy. Um, let me see how we are we doing. I would like you to do homework a little bit. I just want to see if the answers are in the book. I take a real simple sales ratio study. Problem 7.2. It's pretty small. It's all the same kind of property. Um, every Thing is arranged in the proper order. The ratio has been determined. The central tendency, the central, uh, central what? The outliers, there are two outliers. Everything is perfect. You could just see what you can do with 7.2. We'll touch on it tomorrow. And the, the weighted average is just not using outliers. It's not 
discount well, The weighted average the is the total of the sale prices divided by the total of the assessment. It's on my cheat sheet. I'm saying that's the other way. The other way around. Weighted average, total of assessed values divided by the total of sale prices. Again, that's a number that's interesting, not necessarily, it might tell you something. Um, the answers are on page 188. So if you'd like to uh, you know, work through one with the other to the other and, and just bounce that through, um, give that a shot. I think everybody's done today if you want. Can you, so the weighted average is not, is admitting the outliers? It's the weighted average includes, includes the entire the sample. ratio admits the outliers? Is that what that the average means? ratio admits the outliers. Okay. My little, my little page will help you with that. Again, it's the same information that's in the book. In fact, that's all in the book. It's just in one spot. Okay. Oh. The land valuation is not the same thing. The 7.2 is pretty straightforward, not too complicated. Um, you will be asked to do something like that on Friday. It's really, f there's only f five answers, four answers. And I believe they come, um, the upside to Excel is that you have to arrange these by ratio. And if it comes that way, it's a lot easier to do it than sitting in the class and trying to figure out ratios. You get one wrong, you blow it apart. Or I could get the wrong answer. No, I'm trying not to get there. I don't think it's that complicated on the test. But you will need to take, um, as on example, <coughs> number 7-7 seven, seven as an example. There are two different kinds of properties. It almost looks like that's kind of been pared back a little bit. It's not a bad thing. Um, when the state does a sales ratio study, they're only looking at developed parcels. Just so you know, so good land ratio study is not a bad thing to do on the side. That will tell you if your, you know, if your land is at 50% and your house is at 100, your mix is probably wrong. You don't want to up the land values to 100% because that'll kick your land.